Good morning, my name is Erin Weber Johnson. I am delighted to be here today. Today, I want to talk to you about drawing closer to Jesus. I want to talk to you about giving for the repair of the world. And I want to talk to you about how a new paradigm for stewardship, if we are indeed moving from obligation to inspired choice, is requiring a lens of approaching each donor as an act of contextual ministry. In order for us to develop strategies, we need to know why. So I began today with the story of a colleague of mine. Uh, I was part of a, a colleague group, and uh, I, I was with a minister who had been uh, working in a congregation for about three years. She was half-time, and she wanted to move up to full-time. And so I, in my field, I've been doing uh, fundraising of all shapes and sizes, annual giving, capital campaigns, plan giving, working on campaigns ranging from 70,000 all the way up to 8 million. And so she approached me because she wanted to have particular strategies that would work to increase giving in her congregation that would allow her to live more fully into her ministry. And so she approached me and she asked, uh, what, what are some things that I can do, Erin? And so we sat down and the first question I asked her was, so tell me, what is your relationship to money? And what are you talking about on Sunday when you talk about money? I saw immediate resistance to that question. And she paused and she says, I'm, I'm really, I'm really going to have to think about that. But let's, let's go back to strategies. Let's go back to like what's going to work. And I said, no, I really need to know what has been your experience. Tell me. Now, we discussed this in great deal yesterday. Uh, many of our speakers touched on this. And what I have found to be true is that this question is very hard. But it begins long-term relationships. And, and, and it was true for us uh, with this colleague and I. And so what ended up happening was she and I set up a phone call date. For two, every other week, she would call me. And the conversation kept going like this. She would call and say, Erin, I thought up some really great new strategies. I have new ideas. And I'm like, oh, that is so great. Have you thought about your connection to money? <laughs> have you thought about your relationship to God and how it's impacted? And she was like, I'm really going to have to give it some more thought. OK. A year went by of us having the same conversation. And then this spring, she called me. And she was in tears. And she said, I've just had an extremely powerful moment with my congregation. She was preaching from this text from John 5, the healing at the pool. I'm going to read it real quickly to you all. Now, in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. And, th and these lay a great crowd of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, and it stirred up the water. After the stirring of the water, whoever stepped in first was healed of whatever disease he or she had. A certain man was there who had an illness for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition now a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was healed, took up his bed, and he walked. My innovative colleague preached on this, and what she did was she handed out mats and asked people to write on that mat what kept them from getting up and walking. And so she gave them markers, and they filled it out. And then she collected the mats, and she filled out her own mat. And after the service, she looked at the mat, and what she saw brought her to tears. Because she looked at her mat, and she said, 
the very first item was debt and the shame around not being able to control her finances, not being able to do what she needed to do, not being able to make the choices that she wanted to make and live more fully into her ministry. And then she looked at every single mat in that congregation, and every last one said debt and shame. In order to develop strategies, we need to know who we are. We need to know who are in our pews. About a year ago, I was part of a group that consulted at a large Manhattan church. And groups were brought together to talk, similar to what was recommended actually yesterday in our first plenary, to talk about our autobiographies. And we brought together a group of millennials because we wanted to, to know what their thoughts were about money, what their initial experience had been. And so we, we asked, what was your first interaction and in, in knowing? Of those 20, every last one of them noted the stock market crash of 2008, how it was a singularly formative experience for them, how what it did was it fostered their feelings of instability and security. It fostered beliefs of scarcity and thinking about maybe, maybe I need to make more careful choices about my next steps. What we came to realize in that group was that we bring not just our finances, but our brokenness and our fears, our whole selves to the act of giving. And so it is that I propose that in the spiritual discipline of stewardship in the church, when we give our gift to God through the church, both the act of inviting and of giving force us to confront and acknowledge our relationship with money, our shame, our guilt, our frustration, our lack, our abundance, our context, who we are, our stories. It forces us to think who we are when we invite and when we give. And I have really good news today. I have good news for us. Because for many of us that are living in shame, we don't have to live in this shame any longer. And we can invite others to no longer live in their shame around finance. In the act of giving and inviting, we are given an opportunity to connect people to a life-giving God who wants to free us from that. It can draw us in our giving and inviting to a savior that heals us. And through our gift, we participate in the healing of the world. We are changed by our love and action. And so we discussed a number of different theologies yesterday, different language around stewardship. We talked about stewardship as an expression of faith. We talked about giving back what was given to us, about sacrifice. We talked about tithing, obligation, choice. What I'd like to reimagine together today is if stewardship is a ministry, when we live it out, lives are transformed in the giving of gifts to change and repair a broken world. And we reconcile ourselves to God. In the Jewish tradition, there's a theology of charitable giving, tikkun olam, in which God gives us the ministry to repair. In my own tradition, the Episcopal Church, through our baptismal covenant, we commit our lives to reconciling ourselves to God and to one another. When stewardship is ministry, lives are transformed in inviting and giving for change and transformation. So if this good news is true, then how we invite is rooted into culture, generational factors, experience of each child of God. How many of you have ever taken a strep test, a strep throat test? Have you been to the doctor? Yeah, received that swab of <coughs> torture. So last winter, my son and I both had to go in for one of those tests. And we show up, my, my son 
My youngest is five. This was his first test. And you can imagine how excited I was to go. And the doctor comes in, and she like works some magic. Like she was like doing sounds and voices and was patient and calm and made sure that he came out of that not particularly happy to have that swab all the way down his throat, but he wasn't scared. He was okay. For me, she saw me, she knew my experience with the swab test, and she was like, in and out, let's go, right? And I was happy about that. I didn't need any sounds and voices. I just needed to go, right? So too, when we go to the hospital, right? When we visit someone in a pastoral, if you're a Stephen minister or uh, on a clergy call, when you go to the hospital to visit someone, when you enter that room, you take into account that person's age. You take into account that person's gender. You take into account, does someone else need to be in the room with me when I make this visit? You take into account their previous experience of you, their previous experience of God, their previous connection to the church. Why? Because in that moment, you want to be able to create a connection. You want to meet them where they are. You want to invite them to a Jesus that heals, but in a place where they can receive that information. So too we do in the act of stewardship as ministry. So it is with that in mind that I want to briefly talk a bit about some new donor motivations that have emerged over the past two years. And it's important that I name this because these are new donor motivations that we hadn't seen in the nonprofit world, we hadn't seen in the church. And I want to make you aware of this as part of this overarching theology of repair. So since the, the 2016 election, what we have seen a record number uh, of gifts to advocacy-based organizations. Uh, NAACP reported record gifts, NRA reported record gifts, Planned Parenthood. Why? Chronicle of Philanthropy noted, as well as a number of different, um, uh, different publications, noted that there are two new reasons why people are giving over the past two years. First, rage and catharsis. And the second, a need for agency. This past June, I don't know if you all know, do you know who Seth MacFarlane is? Oh, good. <laughs> Seth MacFarlane, whose shows are part of the Fox network, uh, made headline news because he was so distraught by some of the commentary that was made on Fox News. He was distraught by some of the things that he heard. And out of a, a sense of rage, perhaps, or a sense of needing agency, he made a very large $2.5 million gift to NPR. Here is an example that I'd like to share of a RAGE donation site. Websites have actually been created around these donor motivations. Here you'll see where you can go to RAGEDONATE.COM. I'm not advocating, this is just an example. RAGEDONATE.COM, there are a number of different quotes that could make you angry. You click on that and they send you to a nonprofit organization to which you can donate. <laughs> Isn't this incredible? <laughs> what this speaks to me is that as we are experiencing new donation uh, motivations, as we are experiencing new characteristics, as Bruce really, I, I think, was spot on to say, as we're realizing that some of our previous assumptions we need to re-examine, it becomes more and more important for us to have a language and a theology that is about repair and restoration. Because we're in a time where we are feeling a sense of disconnection. It, 
In front of you, I have a picture of Kasan, Alaska. I just spent the last four weeks uh, on sabbatical. I took a break to come here, and I'm about to go on sabbatical again. I spent four weeks uh, discerning God's call for my own life, um, discerning what God wanted me not just to do, but to be as an individual. And part of that was going to Kasan, uh, where my, my husband grew up um, on Prince of Wales Island. Have any of you ever heard of Kasan? I don't blame any of you if you haven't. It's a village of 70 people. It's an indigenous village. Um, uh, Haida and Clinket uh, are there. And in order to get there, you go to Ketchikan, Alaska, and you take a, either a four-hour ferry or a float plane, and then you drive a really long time on bumpy roads. And there, it's a village that had been reclaimed in the 1930s, and they have reclaimed a number of, of different totem poles. So the totem poles are interspersed in these deep woods. And you can imagine my shock uh, when one day I'm walking through the woods and I'm looking at these gorgeous totem poles that describe families' identities, that describe the stories of giving and sacrifice through the years of their own people that share their oral tradition in a very visual way. And lo and behold, who do I find on the top of a totem pole but Abraham Lincoln? I was stunned. <laughs> there, there is no other white person on any of the totem poles. And I, I did a little research and I started asking um, some of the folks around, and they said this totem pole came from the late 1800s, um, and it was to mark the end of, of slavery. This was part of their oral story, their oral narrative that they wanted to include. I share this today because what they wanted to include was one man's desire for repair and reconciliation, but also his enormous gift to the world in a very visual way. Theologies of giving are vitally important. The language we use when talking about giving, moving from a paradigm of obligation to a paradigm of inspired choice. But when we're thinking about data, when we're thinking about finding out who's in our pews, there is a, a set of information that we don't have. And I want to talk to you very briefly about this today. Uh, about three years ago, I was leading a, a training. I, I lead a number of different trainings for a group of 200 or so Episcopalians. And I was talking through generational characteristics and how you apply different strategies depending on the different characteristics. And the Bishop of Maryland, Bishop Eugene Sutton, stood up and said, you know, this data is really great, and it really reflects my white congregations, but do you have any data for communities of color? And I, I said, um, no, I don't, actually. And he said, can you get it for me? And I said, yes, I will get it for you. And that marked a moment in my life that has changed me irrevocably. You see, I made a promise to him thinking it was going to be easy to get data for communities of color. Surely it's out there, right? And I went to every national body that you can think of. I, I went to Pew, I went, I went everywhere. And I went to every single denominational national base and I asked, do you have this data? And they were like, you know, we've been meaning to get it, but we don't have it. We don't have it. So let me be really clear what happens if we don't have this data. When we don't have data, people like me stand in front of people like you, and we talk about generational characteristics, and we build our strategies from that data based on what we have, what we know. And then you all hopefully come home and say, oh, that was really great. Let me employ these strategies except those strategies were based on limited data, right? And we continue to create a cycle. In the beginning, I thought it was just sheer negligence. 
I've now considered it institutional racism. And so this is a great group of folks that I have the privilege to work with the last two years. We've just finished our fundraising effort in order to create a research group that will be able to address this gap in fundraising data for communities of color. When we think about folks in our pews, if we live into this new paradigm of inspired choice, it begins with us asking, who are in our pews? How do we find out that information? Now, if you'll come to my workshop this afternoon, I can talk to you about some real easy, practical ways to get this information. In general, there are some questions that we can begin asking each other. When have you felt most inspired to give? Why have you given in the past? What are your earliest experiences of giving? What can be hard to hear and why? What can we pray with you about? What keeps you on your mat? What keeps you from a close relationship to Jesus? As we explore language and motivations, it's my prayer that we can contextually use this information to work to repair the world and draw others to God. Thank you.